book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 2 as we come to God's Word. And uh, we began last week in this passage, and this is a continuation of what we noticed last week. Of course, the Apostle Peter is writing in, in this great and fantastic book. It's a short epistle, three, three chapters in length, but it is chock full of, of prophetic uh, implications and, and promises, re, uh, things that God has told us He's going to do, and that you, may I tell you, you can hang your hope on them. And I'm thankful that God's Word is true, aren't you? And that you and I have hope today because of Jesus Christ. Now, God has called us to live our lives for Him. And that's the basis, that's the foundation of, of this particular letter. The Apostle Peter has spent his life, uh, for the most part, his adult life, serving, and, uh, serving Jesus Christ. As one of Jesus' disciples, he followed Christ. And, you know, Peter was not a perfect man by any means, was he? We oftentimes criticize him for his lack of faith, but even last week we saw on Sunday night that he was the only one that got out of the boat. Uh, we were swift to judge Peter because he was uh, swift to speak, wasn't he? And uh, he oftentimes, in, uh, maybe it was a nervous habit that he had, uh, but when no one knew what to say, Peter was quick to open his mouth. And oftentimes it got him into trouble. But he was, he was quick to act. He was a man of faith. He, he lived for the Lord. And now he's writing at the end of his life. He had just finished, many believe, to have written his first epistle uh, to suffering saints. And now he's writing uh, on the brink of his own death. Uh, soon he would lay down his life for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He would actually be, uh, be crucified upside down upon a cross uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ. But he's writing now, bringing to our remembrance the things that God has instructed us to do. You and I are to live our lives faithfully for Jesus Christ. And, and that's my, the desire I have for my own life. I want to live my life as fervently for Jesus Christ now as I ever have. And I don't want there to ever be a time in my life where I look back and think, man, those were the good old days. Remember when I could do all these things? You know, remember when I served the, served the Lord in, in such and such a capacity? I never, want to, I never want to allow that to come to be. I want to serve the Lord as fervently now in the present as I ever will. And I, I implore you to do the same. Serve Christ fervently in the present. Never retreat. Never let up. Always serve the Lord with all of your heart. And now Peter, he's, he shifts his attention here. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we see here that, that God... That God is warning us. Uh, last week we saw uh, lessons surrounding false prophets and, and false teachers and how you and I are to live our lives for God now. But in verse number, uh, in verse number three, the Bible says this. Uh, at the end of the, of, the, of the verse, the Bible says, And their damnation slumbereth not. It's important for you and me to be rooted and grounded in the truth. Uh, in a day and age when truth is up for debate, God's word is truth. It's forever settled in heaven. This is truth. This word never changes because truth never changes. The Bible says of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we're thankful that Jesus Christ is the same. The truth never changes. But you and I, we must always work uh, to, to, keep our, to keep our lives in line with the word of God. And consider some of the warnings that Christ has given. Of course, we're living in the last days. I'm persuaded of this. Uh, but even since the time of Christ, we've been in the last days. As a matter of fact, even in chapter number 3, the Bible tells us uh, of, of the timeline of the Lord. The Bible says, Beloved, be not ignorant, verse number 8 of, of chapter 3, of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You know, don't, you cannot put a time on Jesus' return. Only God the Father knows when Christ is going to come back and, uh, and call His people home. But understand this, that this same Jesus, according to Acts chapter 1, will come in like manner. And you and I, we can be very thankful for the promises of God and His Word. But as we consider the time in which we live, the time, uh, 2022, it's full of, of a terrible spirit, isn't it? The Bible warns us in, in 1 John uh, chapter number 2 that the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. The Bible says in verses 18 and 19 of, of 1 John chapter 2, it says, Little children, uh, it is the last time. 
And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they are not of us. Uh, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not of us. Understand that uh, people, you are known by your fruits. Uh, by your works, you are known. And, and, and the Lord warns us here in, in the first three verses of chapter 2 concerning the work, the attitude, the motivation of these false prophets. But the world is marked by a rebellion. It's marked by selfishness. It's, it's marked by immorality. In 2, Peter, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, Verses 1 through 9, the Bible says this, this know also. In the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, uh, uh, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And the Bible says traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And our response is this, from such turn away. The Bible says, for, uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and, leave, uh, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he names names. He says, now, uh, now as John, uh, Jonas and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. You see, we need truth, don't we? Not only do we need truth, we need to, we need to obey truth, to walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Bible says that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, we, we, we recognize here that there, is, there are many implications here concerning these false teachers. And this morning, as we come to the second half, or the second part of this passage we see the promise of God on full display. Aren't you glad that God is trustworthy? Aren't you glad that God is faithful? The Lord Himself has established a precedent of how He deals with these. And so you and I, in, in return, ought to have the proper response to God. Now, if you're able, I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to read, beginning in verse number 4 of 2 Peter chapter number 2. Uh, verse number 4, the Bible says this, and we'll read down through verse number 9. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, and cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example that, uh, unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the, the godly out of temptations." and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Father, we're thankful today that we have your word and that we can trust in it. And God, we, as we come to the scriptures this morning, our prayer is that you would help us to fully understand all that the Bible says and, and how this applies to our lives. And Lord, what our response to you ought to be. And we're thankful that we have a great God. The Bible says, Lord, you tell us in Isaiah, saying, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Lord, you are Almighty God. You're the Lord of hosts. You're the Ancient of Days. And, and Father, there's nothing hid from thee, and there's nothing too hard for thee. And so, God, today we ask that you would strengthen our faith, our hope, our confidence, and, uh, and our resolve to live for you for such a time as this. And Lord, so we pray that you'd speak to us today. God, challenge us and help us. Lord, help us see clearly the Word of God this morning and obey it. And Father, again, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know the Lord as their Savior, 
Oh, Father, our prayer for them is that today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to two words this morning found in verse number four. Two words that just at a glance we may just pass over, but they're, they're verses upon which the rest of this passage hinges. It's, really, it's, it's truly the key to unlock what, what the Lord is addressing here in these verses. The Bible says in verse number nine, or I'm sorry, verse number four, it says, if God. Did you, did you see that? It says for, then if God. If God. What does this mean? It means God knows what he's doing. It means that God is able. Do you believe that God is able this morning? And, and God has, has given us two profound illustrations from, from the book of Genesis uh, to reinforce the fact that God is able. Christian, let me ask you a question. Was considering the magnitude of the flood, considering the, the power that God demonstrated when he rained fire and brimstone down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, those are two mighty powerful examples and, and we consider the problems that we have in our own lives. If God can do that, if God can save Noah, if God can, can, God, and God can deliver Lot, what can't he do in your life? If God can do that, what can't he do for you? Sometimes life is difficult, isn't it? A life is hard. Uh, things happen that we don't understand. Uh, we ask questions that we will never know the answers to. You know the great question that all men ask that no one knows the answer to is the question why. We don't know why God allows things to take place. We don't know why God does things. We don't know why God allows this to happen to, to one person and this to happen to another person. All we know is that God is able. And that God, may I tell you, God is faithful. David said that he had been young, that he had been old, and yet in all of his days, he had never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. God is able, but the Bible says, now, uh, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Understand that God, Christian, your God, the God of this book, the Bible, is a God who is able. Yes, he is. And there is nothing too hard for the Lord. As, as we come this morning to God's Word, just by way of introduction, I want to invite you to turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis. Of course, there are many, many references here. And just a few weeks ago, I, I preached a... Uh, a message from uh, from first Peter Peter references this again a second time uh, but in, in so for instance in uh, in second Peter chapter 2 the Bible says for if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah the eighth person a preacher of righteousness bringing in uh, the flood of uh, upon the world of the ungodly. What does this mean? Well, it all begins in Genesis chapter 3. Turn there with me, if you would, please. Genesis chapter 3. We find here the fall of man. Do you realize that, that death had not come before the fall? God created all things good. It was very good. In six literal days, God created the universe. From nothing, He created everything. But by the word of His power, God created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God made man in his image. In the image of God made he him. Male and female made, uh, created he them. So we see that God created man. He placed him in the garden and he gave them a command. So you can, you can eat of everything in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat it or touch it, lest ye die. That's the command. However, uh, as we come to chapter 3 of Genesis, we find Satan. He has taken upon himself the form of a serpent and channeled his message uh, to the woman, to the man, uh, through 
Uh, this serpent, the Bible says in verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that uh, ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So up till this point, man was innocent. Uh, they were innocent. They had, they had obeyed the clear command of God, and now Satan comes in, and now he is trying to, to thwart uh, God's creation. He's trying to undermine uh, the working of God. Uh, he's going to destroy by bringing sin into the world. And he, and he accomplishes it. The Bible tells us that in verse number 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant uh, to the eyes of the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, of the tree, uh, fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the Bible says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And the Bible says down in verse number 9, is the Bible says, And the Lord God called uh, unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Adam, what, do you think God knew where he was? <laughs> you can't hide from God, okay? The question was not so much for God, but it was for Adam. Adam, what have you done? Is in essence what God asked. Adam, what have you done? Where art thou? In God, we see the fall of man. And God addresses Adam. He addresses Eve. He addresses creation. Why did God... Look, look what the Bible says. Look in verse 15 of, of Genesis chapter 3. I don't, want to get, I don't want to get ahead of myself this morning. The Bible says in verse number 15, as, as God speaks, as God pronounces judgment upon creation, do you realize that everything we see today is the result of the fall of man? Uh, the, the, this world that was created in splendor and beauty and glory and majesty, uh, this perfect creation that uh, was marred by sin. And all the, all the hardship that we see today, all the death that has come, all the, all the despair, all the wars, all the fightings, all the turmoil, all the strife, it's all the result of sin. But I'm thankful that on the very, very moment man sinned, God promised the Redeemer. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we find the first mention of the coming Messiah. The Bible says in verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, uh, and between thy seed and her seed. So he is now, he is addressing the serpent. He's addressing Satan himself. There's enmity here. They're, they're at odds. They're enemies. He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, and notice her seed. Note that statement here. Her seed. And the Bible goes on to say, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. He was, he was born of a virgin. No human man had any part in it. The, the, the Holy Spirit came upon the woman, and Jesus Christ was conceived. It was the seed of the woman. But do you understand that, that Satan, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse number 15, began to plot and to scheme so that he could destroy man? Who's redemption for? Redemption is for man. Who sinned? Man sinned. So here's, here's, here's Satan's goal. To destroy the image of God. And make man unredeemable. It's a well thought out plan. I want you to turn the page in your Bible to the book of uh, to chapter number chapter number six. 
of Genesis. Genesis chapter 5, it speaks of, of a lot of death. It's a, the, the genealogy of man. And we're introduced to a man that Peter mentions twice. Once in, in, um, in 1 Peter and again in, in 2 Peter. And he begins to describe for us what actually took place in the world pre-flood. And I understand this is, I believe, and I know there are, there are differing views on this, and I'm okay with that. But I believe that this, is, this, was God, this was Satan's attack on the seed of the woman to, to make it so that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, could not come into the world. So that redemption could not be extended to man. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Now, the, the term sons of God is it, it, it's a, a literal reference to the angels. The angels that sinned. And, and the Bible describes for us here what happened. What these sons of God did. The Bible says that the sons of God saw the, the, uh, the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with them, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. The Bible says in verse 4, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So what had happened, that this angelic host, they came down into earth, and they began to, to marry the daughters of men. And over the process of time, they corrupted God's image. We're in, we're, then we're introduced again to this man named, Mo, uh, named Noah. The Bible says in verse number 9, I'm sorry, let's just begin in verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But the Bible says in verse number 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So amongst this whole generation of corrupt people, a wicked, terrible, awful ungodliness, there was one man. There was one family that had not intermingled with this corrupt race of people. Remember, they, they destroyed God's image. And now there's Noah and his family. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. You know what that, that, that when, when the Bible describes Noah here, he's, he's describing him not so much morally, though I believe he was a godly man, the Bible describes him as a preacher of righteousness. But when the Bible speaks of him as perfect in his generation, the term that, that God is using is the, same, is the same word that he uses to describe the, the animal sacrifices in the law. Without blemish. He was without spot. He had not been, uh, his, his, he has not been corrupted by the angelic beings. I know this might seem strange. But God goes on and he describes what happened. Here, even in the New Testament. But the Bible goes on to say, it says, And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted, themselves, or corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And God instructed Noah to, to build an ark of gopher wood 
and to pitch it within and without, and God brought uh, two of every uh, unclean beast, seven of all clean animals, and, and, and they were in that ark with, with Noah and his family, and the flood came, and it destroyed all living. And really, the, the world in which we live today is a, is a, is a sign of all the, the cataclysmic, the catastrophic damage that the, the worldwide flood caused. The Grand Canyon, uh, the mountains. Did you realize that, that on Mount Everest, there are ocean fossils on the top of Mount Everest? How did they get there? Flood. The whole earth was covered. All flesh was destroyed. The Bible, I want you to look with me, if you would please, in the New Testament, the book of Jude. That little one, one chapter book between... Uh, Third John and the book of the Revelation. And here again, God, God has told us in 2 Peter chapter 3 that, that He had placed these, these angels that had sinned, this great sin. He placed them, put them in chains in hell and they're, where they're currently awaiting judgment. The Bible says in Jude, in verse number, uh, verse number 5, it says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, so you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. The Bible says in verse 6, says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness on the judgment of the great day. And, and this, they left their first estate. They, they came, they did all of this sin. They, they, they destroyed the image of God. They sought to destroy the image of God. But if God. God did not allow what they did to hinder His plan. God in His power, in His might, in His love, in His grace, still preserved humanity so that He could redeem man. And we look back in, in Genesis, if you would please, in Genesis uh, chapter 18 and 19, we see here, uh, the reference uh, uh, that God gives to Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis chapter uh, 18 and 19, we find something similar taking place. May I tell you the sins of the angels in Genesis chapter 6 were the same as the sins of man in Genesis 18 and 19? How they went after strange flesh. Yeah. And we see here that, that, God, uh, that God dealt with that. There was... There was, there was Noah that God delivered. There was Lot that God delivered. You realize that God knows His own people? Amen. The, Lord. the Lord, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He knows you. Amen. Your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're never going to be forgotten. Yes. You'll never be forsaken. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 18... I like what the Bible says in verse number 14. Here's a great question for you. It's, re, it's a rhetorical question. He says in verse number 14 of Genesis chapter 18, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Of course, he's speaking to, to Abraham and to Sarah. Sarah laughed because God told, uh, told Abram, Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child in their old age when it was humanly impossible is there anything too hard for God? No, there's nothing too hard for God. But in the same chapter, we find that God begins to pronounce judgment upon the, the cities of the plain against Sodom and against Gomorrah. But the Bible says in verse number 23, and this is a, this is a verse that I cling to in my own life, and I encourage you to do the same. The Bible says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked. He says, Peradventure, uh, there be uh, 50 righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and spare not the place for the 50 righteous that are therein, that, uh, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. The Bible says, notice, verse, the end of verse 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Christians, understand that God will always do what is right. Amen. He will never make a mistake. He will always do what is right. He will always do what is good. You can trust in Him. 
In Genesis chapter 18 and 19, it describes how, how God rained fire down from heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, except for Lot and his daughters. And his wife, had she not looked back, if God, those are mighty things that God did. The Bible says, wilt thou also, I'm sorry, shall, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Christian, consider your life today. The things that you endure, the things that you face, the problems that you encounter in your life, will not the judge of all the earth do right? What does that mean? It means he's in control. When God appears to be out of control, he's in control. You know, we don't have this deistic view of God. That, so a deist believes that God created, but now God takes his hands off of it and just lets it run its course. That's not God. God is sovereign. God works in the affairs of man. God works in your life. We, we would refer to that as the providential care of God. And will he not do you right? He may not give you what you think you want. He may not allow things in your life that you, that you deem to be pleasant and enjoyable. But I'm here to tell you that God will always do the right thing. Yes, he will. If right. God, Amen. God had not forsaken Noah, right. God had not forsaken Lot, Amen. if God, he will not forsake you either. Amen. So if God can do that, what should my response to God be? I want you to look back with me, please, in 2 Peter chapter number 2. I want you to write down three simple lessons this morning. Our response to God. If God can do this, if God can do all things, if God can, can spare uh, the righteous, if God can deliver from, from destruction, if God, if God, if God, if God, if God, then what should I do? Well, the first lesson I want us to, um, to take note of this morning is that we need to be faithful. Would you write that down? Two simple words. Be faithful. Consider Noah. For 120 years, he and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, constructed that ark. And you ever wonder what went on all, those, all that time? The Bible says the world was full of violence. It was a wicked place. It was por pornographic, it was, it was wicked, it was licentious, it was, it was deplorable. It was so badly corrupt that God had to destroy all flesh. So what was, but what did Noah continue doing? He continued to be faithful. Look what the Bible says in verse number, verse number four. It says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah the eighth person so if you were to read back in Genesis chapter 5 you see that he eight, he was eight generations removed from Seth the eighth person the bible says that he was a a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly he was a preacher of righteousness he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a man perfect in his generation. He would not allow himself, he guarded his family, he would not allow those he loved to become contaminated by the wicked, awful things of the world. He was faithful. Amen. A Christian, in the time and hour in which you and I live, you and I, in like manner, ought to strive to be faithful. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Be faithful. Don't surrender. Don't give up. Don't give in. Continue living for God. Even when to others, it makes no sense. Do you realize that there are people driving up and down this road today? And they look 
in this par- the parking lot of this church and they don't understand why you're here. Why? It's like the only day we have off and they're at church. Why? What's the point? The point is there's a God that's worthy. Yeah, amen. That's right. The point is that there's a, a Savior who died for us. Yeah. The truth is, there is no reason not to be faithful. Christian, be faithful. Just continue living for God. Notice the second lesson that we learned this morning. And it really has to do with Lot. And it's this, that you and I, would you write this down? Guard your heart. Guard your heart. The Bible says back in in 2 Peter chapter 2, In verse number 6, he says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample to those that uh, that after should live ungodly. You realize just a few months ago, there was an article online. They believe they found the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there there are signs of fervent heat, like nuclear blast type of heat, that just incinerated everything and destroyed everything near it how could this be because the bible's true now it was a some scientific uh article and they they tried to excuse away the 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 reality of god raining fire and brimstone down from heaven upon the seas of the plain but the fact of the matter is it's there it's accounted for there's signs of truth there but but what did what what did lot do the Bible tells us in Genesis that, that Lot pinched his tent towards Sodom. And before long, Lot ended up living in the town, and not only living there, but occupying chief positions in the town. He sat at the gate of the city. It was a place of, of authority. It was a place of, of, of leadership. You know what Lot did? Lot failed. He failed his family. I mean, you, you read, for the sake of time, we, we can't go back and read everything that Lot did, but it was dreadful. Offered his own children to be abused physically? It's awful. Lost, lost his children. Only he and his, two da- his youngest daughters survived. His wife had so much affection for the city of Lot, of Sodom and Gomorrah, that as, she, as they fled, she turned back and God turned her to a pillar of salt. But what happened? The Bible describes him as he vexed his righteous soul. Look what the Word of God says in verse number 7. He uses many adjectives here. It says, and delivered just Lot. He was just. How can a man, living in such a place, holding such positions, be a, be a just man? Well, he had faith in God. Yeah, I'm glad that salvation is not works-based. Yeah, because if it were, none of us would attain it. Right. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. And the Bible says, and delivered just lot, notice, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Vexed. He was vexed. You know, what, is that, what does that word vexed mean? It means he allowed himself to be tortured by it. That's what the word vexing means. It means torturous. You know what the sins of the world ought to do to us? It ought to be torturous to watch us, to to watch as, as awful sin unfolds before our eyes. There are sins of society, sins of our culture, sins in the world that, that are vexing. The Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul, in verse number 8. It says, For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and in hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Christians, guard your hearts. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. We're, we're in the world, but we're to not be of the world. Read John chapter 17 at your, at your leisure. Take your time. Read it. See the Lord's intention for you. But notice the last lesson that we see this morning. Look back in 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse number 9. 
The Bible says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly. I'm sorry, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. The last lesson that you and I need to take to ourselves today is that we must learn to have faith in God. Have faith in God. Would you write that down? Have faith in God. What did Job say? Job, a man that endured so much, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Christians, you've got to learn to trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Trust the Lord. Have faith in God. You see, even in Hebrews chapter number 11, Noah is mentioned. And he's mentioned as a man who had faith. He said, by faith, Noah. By faith. Christians, you've got to live by faith. You've got to trust God. If God can do all of these things in, in a seemingly imp- that are impossible for man, God can handle your problems. God can handle the difficulties that we face in life. Because God is able. If God. The Lord, look, look at verse number 9. It says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. The Lord knows how to do it. And Christian, he knows how to deliver you from the troubles you face every day. You've got to look to him by faith. You've got to trust him. You've got to be obedient. Be faithful. Guard your heart. Have faith in God. The world is the world's terrible. It's a wicked place to be. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You and I have victory because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Have faith in God. God is able. God is faithful. Look, as we close, I want you to look back with me, please. The book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 5. In verse number 9, the Bible says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. By our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're uncertain of where you'll spend eternity. God does not want to pour his wrath out upon you. He will because he's just and he's righteous. But God would much rather pour out his grace upon you. He would much rather you repent of your sin and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand to our feet this morning. In just a moment, we'll have a time of invitation.